The Faroe Islands are in the news again. It's a small island between Scotland and Iceland in the North Atlantic, and it's a self-governing territory of the Kingdom of Denmark with a population of about 54,000 people. But what it's really known for, it's massive pilot whale hunt as well as white-sided dolphin hunt. Now, there's been a coalition of marine conservation organizations that have come out with a report called Unraveling the Truth, Whale Killing in the Faroe Islands. And it basically takes the thought of how these drive hunts are humane, sustainable, and integral part of the local culture, and it takes them to task, and it says, are these right? Is that what the drive hunts do? Are they still thought of as integral part of the culture? Are they sustainable? Are they humane? We're going to talk about it on today's episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. Let's start the show. Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lewin, and this is the podcast where you find out what's happening with the ocean, what you can do to speak up for the ocean, and how you can protect the ocean by taking action. And this is a podcast where we're going to find out what's happening, and this is a press release that I found uh, about the Faroe Islands, because it's been a while since I've done an article on the Faroe Islands, and the press release was released in September, uh, but I wanted to go over it because I thought it was really interesting. Essentially, it takes the uh, sort of the, the claims that the Faroese drive hunts for pilot whales and Atlantic white-sided dolphins uh, are humane, sustainable, and an integral part of the culture. When you often come up against canceling a hunt or trying to uh, you know, talk badly about a hunt or really essentially canceling the hunt. Essentially what you're doing is you're coming up against some fire. You know, people are going to fire back. People who are part of the hunt, who make money off the hunt, they are going to fire back and they are going to say, well, hold on a second. This is part of our culture. We've been doing this for centuries. This is, you know, what we're doing is we're killing humanely, as humanely as possible. Uh, and uh, it's sustainable. Like, you know, the, the fish or the mammals, they're coming back year after year. And, you know, we're going to see that these animals are something that is important. So a lot of times marine conservation organizations come up with either as a part of a collaboration or a coalition and come up with ways to debunk these these types of claims. And that's what this new report does uh, to debunk the claims of whale and dolphin hunters in the Faroe Islands. Like I said, the Faroe Islands have been in the news quite a bit. There have been documentaries on it. There have been a lot of TV shows on it. Um, it's been online. You can probably find some pretty gruesome pictures of these pilot whale and dolphin hunts. Essentially, what these hunts do uh, is when a pod of whales or school dolphins is spotted uh, by, by these hunters, the hunters drive them to the shore and into designated killing bays using a line of boats. Once the animals are in shallow water, they are secured using a round-ended hook driven into their blowholes, the whale's breathing passage essentially, and pulled to land. There, every single whale or dolphin is killed with a knife or sharp spine, uh, I think it's called a sharp spinal lance, pushed into the neck behind the blowhole. This may paralyze the animal, but it also does not necessarily mean that the animal is immediately dead, unconscious, or insensible to pain. So essentially what a lot of people are saying is that these pods of pilot whales or dolphins cannot be humanely chased to shore, secured, or killed. These drive hunts are extremely stressful and painful. The animals are eyewitnesses to their other members of their pod being killed until they themselves meet the same faith. And that was a quote by Dr. Sandra Alter, co-founder of the pro-wildlife organization describing the mass slaughter. Here's a situation. This is this is pretty bad. Like when we look at these pilot whale hunts, they can get pretty bad. The white-sided dolphin hunts, they can get pretty wide, pretty bad. The a- number of animals taken per year. When we talk about hunts, we talk about how much they take. Uh, average is about I think they say 685 pilot whales and 114 dolphins each year. However, some of the major catches, like prior to this latest hunt that that happened in uh, after August and September. 854 pilot whales were, had already been killed as of August 23rd, so obviously way above the average. And more than 1,400 Atlantic white-sided dolphins were killed in a single day in September 2021, which sparked a widespread public outcry. And that actually sparked an episode that I did where I was uh, under, I was reading a different article, maybe a pro Faroe Islands article from Denmark, where they talked about the benefits uh, of the hunt. I've since learned that that was probably a little biased uh, and not true. 
Uh, and when we look at stuff taken, like here's here's what you have to look for. You know, are they humane? Let's look at what's humane when considered for the animal, right? There are a lot of there are a lot of controversial things when it comes to marine mammal hunts. You know, there's no real, you know, uh, there's no real quick kill when it comes to marine mammals. That you know, scientists and veterinarians work at if there's a hunt, they work at the best way possible to get a, an animal dead. Some of them look pretty barbaric and brutal. When you look at the seal hunt in Canada. You, you look at, like, it's basically a spike at the end of a, a stick, and they drive it through the animal's skull. Not fun to watch. Not, not that killing any animal is fun to watch, but not fun to watch. And you wonder, you know, it makes a per, the average person wonder what is going on in people's heads when they think that's humane. But it's the quickest way to kill because the skull's so thick, and it is scientifically proven to be the quickest way to kill. This method here, when we're looking at, you know, driving uh, some sort of sharp, you know, knife or sharp spinal lance into the back of a blowhole to secure them, pull them on to shore. They're not dead yet. They're pulling them on to shore. Then they push the lance into the neck behind the blowhole. They could paralyze it, but they're not necessarily killing it. They don't wait necessarily all the time till they kill it. So they could just be sitting there motionless, in pain, and watching all of their pod be slaughtered one by one. We know that these animals, pilot whales, dolphins, are sentient beings. We know they have emotions. We know they feel pain. We know they have like this emotional, like they have like almost like a, an emotional intelligence. We've seen it in orcas. We've seen it in dolphins. Pilot whales are the same thing. To have to watch your entire pod get and annihilated in one shot has to be pretty brutal while you're waiting for your own death. This method of killing cannot be considered humane. If your animal is not dying right away in the hunt, how can it be considered humane? You don't know if this animal's dead or not. You're not measuring whether they're dead. You know, there are when we when we have to take things for scientific purposes, there are certain steps that you have to follow to ensure that if you do end up, you know, killing the animal, taking its life, there are certain ways that you have to test to make sure the animal's dead so that you're not torturing the animal while it's still alive. If you're dissecting it or cutting it or doing whatever you have to do. There are specific ways in which you have to conduct yourself from an animal ethics point of view to be able to ensure that the animal has passed, make sure that the animal is not feeling any pain as least amount as possible. This may be the least amount of possible according to, at, at this point. However, it's still a pretty brutal and barbaric way to die, knowing especially that these are sentient beings, they feel emotions, to be able to have to watch their pod member be killed has to be torture. And it's very difficult to measure this. It's very difficult to measure this from a scientific uh, point of view. But... It is a brutal th way of dying. It is not something that, you know, is a good way of going. And and that's something, so taking the humane part out of it is not really, you know, a thing that we really need to do. Um, and so I think that's something that you're looking at is, hey, hold on a second. We need to really look at the way these animals are dying and finding out and really answering the question, is this a good way of dying? Is this a humane way of dying? At this point, it's really hard to believe that this is a humane way of dying, right? And so, like here, the proponents of it says in the in the in the article here, the proponents of the pilot whale hunting argue that the capture and killing process is humane. The Royal Society of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals defines humane killing as when an animal is either killed instantly or rendered insensible until death ensues without pain, suffering, or distress. Criteria that the Faroese they call it the Grinda drop. Uh, by its very nature, cannot meet. So modern hunting techniques with motorized vessels, cell phones, and other more effective killing tools have made the hunt more efficient, but not humane. The techniques used to chase, secure, and kill groups of uh, pilot whales and dolphins in the Grindagrab, Grindadrab would not be permitted in the killing of livestock or other animals in most countries. Indeed, a recent review of these techniques conclude that the Grindagrab 
grid to drop, sorry, uh, method of killing cetaceans is ethically and morally unacceptable given our understanding of the sentient nature of these animals. There's more about this claim in the article. I'm going to link to it below or link to it in your app so you can check that out, your podcast app. Uh, and so I think it's really important that you check that out. So now let's move on to the claim, uh, is it a sustainable source? Now, given the nature of these these killings and how many are taken, um, is really interesting to say, hey, like let's let's really look at how these animals are killed and how they live um, and to say are these is this actually sustainable right so the claim you know there's claims that faroese grindadrob grindadrobs um, are sustainable reflect a gross oversimplification of a complex issue these animals are largely based on comparing take levels with population estimates for the species at a large rather uh, at, at large rather than considering local population dynamics so they're looking at the full total population of the world population of pilot whales instead of local population of pilot whales such population estimates are typically based on surveys of large ocean areas and do not consider that these areas may include more than one geographically and or genetically discrete population unit the cetaceans popu- the cetacean populations in effect are treated like pelagic fish stocks with a single undifferentiated population in the whole of the Northeast Atlantic Ocean, from which there are a certain number can be uh, removed for with no significant effect. So what they're saying is that if it's in one large geographical area, they're saying that all these populations are part of one population. So if you're looking at the total number of the population and you remove a, a certain number of it, then it maybe it's sustainable for the entire pilot whale population. Okay. Uh, given that we are now, uh, so from the certain area, sorry, I'm just looking at it here. Given what we now understand about cetacean culture and societies, this is neither accurate nor appropriate. It ignores other factors that are adversely affect, that also adversely affect these populations in the 21st century, including po- uh, pollution, climate change, ship strikes, and incidental capture of, uh, for fish operations. So for some of the species hunted in the Faroese, including the Atlantic white-sided dolphin population data, and are particularly scant, there is no adequate population estimate for these species that could be used to justify the killing quota. In 2022, the Scientific Committee of the International Whaling Commission, the IWC, noted that high number of Atlantic white-sided dolphins recently killed in the Faroe Islands and that uh, in the Fer- Faroe Islands and that this has a- had occurred without a full assessment of their status as a species and the population level. The- so here's what happens a lot of the times. I'm reading this from the- directly from the report. So again, I- this is page three. I'm going to uh, link to this report so you can take a look at it for yourself because I can't cover everything that's in it in this short amount of time. But here's what happens in a lot of a lot of times when there's an environmental assessment or some sort of impact assessment, a company or consulting agency will kind of take a look at the population in general, and they will look at this population. And they will say whether this is a population that you can actually take a certain amount of animals per year, and I mean take, I mean hunt, and so they'll look at the sustainability of these animals. Now, here's what I'm thinking: the white sided dolphin case that I just read is you know, where they don't really know the full estimate of the population. They don't have a good idea. There hasn't been enough research, enough observations to say that these animals, to take these animals are particularly sustainable because there's really no overestimate or there's no estimate of the overall population. So how can you say that this is sustainable when you actually have no idea how big this population is, right? That's a that's a big thing. Uh, and then you look at animals like dolphins and pilot whales. They're slow to reproduce. They're long-lived animals, and have one. And like the pilot whales have one of the longest birth intervals of any cetacean, given birth, uh, giving birth only once every three to five years. So it's not as if like once they pop out a, a calf, they can pop out another one nine months or ten months. This is you know the gestation lasts twelve to sixteen months. That's a long time. And a calf that then nurses for about thirty-six to forty-two months. Thus, a pilot whales typically give birth only to five or fewer calves during their lifetime. That's not a lot. And when you're looking at the amount of animals that are taken every year, it's it can only last a certain amount of time. And I think that's that's the problem with a lot of fisheries or a lot of marine mammal hunts, but especially fisheries. When the cod stocks, you know, when they collapsed, we knew they were starting to collapse because the government of Canada were they were doing estimates they were doing stock assessments they knew this was going to drop they knew the 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 
the fish, the fisheries was going to hit a capacity. Uh, and they just, they told the politicians, the politicians didn't say anything. And it totally revolutionized the way fisheries management was done in the future in Canada, as well as the U.S., because they hit the same kind of problem. Unfortunately, the fishers had to pay for that and they had to change, a lot of them had to change their uh, their way of living, the way they got their living and go more into the oil and gas fields, right, and oil and gas industry in Alberta. It had a big, pretty significant impact. But if people were transparent about the numbers and the politicians were transparent at that time, which they are a little better now, we would have known that this population was, was tanking. And to take these animals is not the right thing to do. When you don't have a strong estimate of the population of an animal and you're starting to take hundreds per year, sometimes thousands per year, now you're starting to really play with fire. And it may not look like these animals are dwindling, but we don't know if these animals are dwindling. We have no idea what their population is. We have no idea, even within their population, if there are subpopulations. Right? Are there subpods that are just kind of hanging out on their own? And what happens when you take when you start taking an entire pod of dolphins or pilot whales? And just imagine that. Think about all the genetic diversity you're losing all in one shot. Each pod, if they are not mixing with the other pods, that even that much, there's going to be genetic variation between the different populations, between the different pods. And they might have different behaviors. They might have different eating behaviors. They might have different ecosystem impact behaviors. We have no idea because we don't know much about this population. And we're not finding out much about the population because we're hunting it. And the governments are allowing this to happen, right? Because they're saying, well, it's very, it's, you know, it is sustainable. We have no idea if it's sustainable or not. There's, there's not, there's nothing happening saying that this is sustainable. There's no population estimate to say, hey, you know what? We actually know how many there are. We know what pods are coming from, and we're only taking a few from each pod. No, you're taking the opportunity when a, some pilot whales come just outside the bay of the Faroe Islands. You run them in. You drive them in there with your boats into the bay, and you trap them, and then you kill them, which we know is not humane. So is it sustainable? No, it actually isn't sustainable because we don't really know much about these whales and these dolphins. And that's something we need to change. Even before you even start thinking about whaling again, this needs to be changed, right? Now let's talk about whether it's integrally, it's if it's an integral part of the culture. A lot of, I, I, should, I should mention, go back in history on this one and say, look, whaling was a very popular thing in the early 1900s, even in the late 1900s. Whaling was used for oil. Whale, was, whale blubber was used for oil energy, getting energy. We quickly found out different ways to get energy, whether they're dirtier or not, whether they had an impact or not. That's another issue. Um, obviously, oil and gas has had an issue on our, and coal has had an issue on our planet, but it also gives us energy and what many of us are based on right now, which we're trying to change. So knowing that when the, the whale, the International Whale Commission stopped whaling for most places, around the world and most countries around the world, we started to see, you know, these populations rebounding, right? And that was really nice to see. They were, they were really rebounding. Now, some cultures, two in particular, this was the Faroe Islands and Japan, they decided to keep it up because, you know, they said, you know what, this is really part of our culture. Our, anim our people like to eat the whale meat as part of the ceremonies or part of their culture. And so they want to be able to continue to hunt. And so, you know, we've talked about the Japanese involvement in the whale hunt in the South, uh, South uh, Ocean Sea. That has been a whole thing where a TV show was created, Whale Wars, and, you know, the, the Sea Shepherd uh, Conservation Society, as well as Greenpeace, used to take part in ramming boats and getting violent and, and basically being as annoying as possible to the, you know, the Japanese ships so that they would eventually get annoyed and never come back, which is exactly what happened at some point. Um, not only just that pressure, but the pressure from the from other uh, member parties in the IWC of stop hunting. Now they're starting, they're, they're continuing to hunt whales, but just in their own borders, in their own Japanese borders, which they're perfectly allowed to do and it's legal to do. It's not against any of their regulations. But they always claim that it's part of their culture. That's why they continue to do it. People eat it as, as a cultural significance and people hunt it as a cultural significance. But that may not always be the case for the Faroe Islands, right? Pilot whale hunting has been conducted in the Faroe Islands since the Viking Age. Whale meat was traditionally an important source of food, but the islands are now modern 
a modern prosperous society with one of the highest standards of living in the world. Despite the uh, historical significance of pilot whale hunting in the Faroe Islands, cultures are not static. Rather, they evolve in response to a need uh, and are expand to our need to uh, to need and our expanding understanding of how human activities negatively impact animals and the environment. Some examples of this are the replacement of the Mexican Cotscale Pato Festival involving the ritual of slaughter of iguanas, opossums, and ducks with a human alternative with a humane alternative. The bullfighting ban in Catalonia, which ended 600 years of that tradition, and the shift in South Korea away from the norm of farming dogs for meat, uh, as evidenced by the government's closure of major dog meat market, markets and the slaughterhouses. Most, uh, most opposite, the drive for the drive hunts, the whales in the Scottish Islands, which were very similar to those in the Faroe Islands, were abandoned long ago due to lack of need for their meat. Today, most Faroese people do not participate in whaling, nor do they consume cetacean products from the hunt. According to the KVF poll, 61% of the Faroese people never or rarely participate in whaling, while the Gallup poll found that 71% of the Faroese people never or never or rarely participate in the hunts or have not done so for at least 10 years or for over 10 years. In the Faroe Islands, men and are, men are both the primary consumers of whale meat and the greatest advocates of whaling. The Gallup poll found that 33% of the men of the Faroe Islands participate in whaling activities at least once a year, with 94% of the women never rarely participating in the, whale, in the actual whaling. Uh, a large part due to national health uh, warnings, increasing numbers of Faroese uh, people are abstaining from eating whale meat. According to the Gallup poll, 66% of uh, Faroese people rarely or never eat cetacean meat and, and only 4% uh, percent eat whale meat weekly. The KVF poll found that the only uh, that only 0.6 percent of the Faroese people eat meat uh, weekly, with 13 percent eating one to three times per month. There's now an opportunity for the people to, of the Faroe Islands to find other ways to, to honor their relationship, past and present, with the marine mammals that helped sustain earlier generations. So what this report is suggesting, and again I'll link to this report in the uh, show notes. But what this report and this claim is suggesting is that it's not really, you know, the part of the majority of the Faroe Islands. It might be part of some of the culture, but it's a culture that's dying. It's a culture that not a lot of people are maintaining. 61% say they haven't really participated, right? Um, and I think that's that's pretty cool. And so, it, it, you know, it seems to be the trend. Maybe it's pressure from outside. I'm not sure. Or maybe it's just the modernization of society. And this is a pretty, this is a society that's pretty old. We also mentioned, you know, from the humane factor was the fact that technologies have gotten really good and really efficient in finding and hunting and killing pilot whales. The methods that they use may not be humane anymore, but their technology has advanced. They have seduced, they have motorboats. You know, it's, it's an easier way to catch more and more whales and dolphins which is not good for the whales and dolphins. So, you know, if they're going to continue with the hunt, they should, and they say it's part of the culture. Ideally, I guess, they should just go back to what their culture was before and hunt that way if they really want to be part of their culture. But it doesn't look like these, uh, the market is there for the, in the Faroese Islands, but also it could be. And is it really right to eat that food? You know, when you have high mercury levels within pilot whales and dolphins, you don't really want to be eating too much of, of the whale meat. So maybe it's a ceremonial thing like shark fin soup, but it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like it's just more of something that's readily available because they have this hunt. People are hunting in droves. People are hunting a lot of pilot whales and dolphins. And that is a shame, my friends. That is quite the shame. So I would like to see this. I just want to provide this update to kind of put you where, you know, give you an idea of where things are. Um, there's still as a there is a call to stop this Faroese uh, hunt, this drive hunt. And it's something that, you know, we should be backing. You know, there are ways you can participate every day through a lot of online petitions and there's some organizations. I'll try and find some and link in, in the show notes. Um, but that's it for today, for today's update. I would love to know your thoughts. What do you think of the Faroese drive hunt? Do you think this is something that 
you know, is going to continue on for a while? Do you think it's something that we should be stopping? How would you suggest we as outsiders who don't live in the Faroese Islands have a conversation, have a dialogue with these, uh, with the hunters, with the people and find out why they're hunting and why they continue to hunt and what they can do to stop, what we can do to stop this hunt from continuing on. That's it for today's episode. If you want to get in touch with me, you can do so at How to Protect the Ocean. Just DM me on Instagram at How to Protect the Ocean. It's all one word. And of course, if you want to go to the website, speakupforblue.com forward slash contact, you can contact me or speakupforblue.com and just go on the homepage, look at the microphone and just leave me a voicemail because I'd love to hear your voice. Always love to hear your voice. And don't forget to smash that follow button uh, or subscribe button, whichever app you're on, so that you can get constant updates for uh, how to protect the ocean material we do it monday wednesdays and fridays if you've just listened to this and you just came across this follow leave a message and a review i would love to hear your thoughts on the show um and i'm sure some other people who are trying to decide whether they want to hear the, sh- the thoughts on the show they would love to hear your thoughts so i want to thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of the how to protect the ocean podcast that's it for me today i'm your host andrew lewin have a great day we'll talk to you next time and happy conservation. Mm-hmm.